Good morning, friends. I'm so grateful that you're joining us on this Palm Sunday. I, I hope that you had a plant at home that you were waving or, or at least holding on to as we began this service. I, I'm so thankful that you're a part of this Holy Week journey, uh, the one that we're wrapping up today as we've gone through Lent uh, and the one that we're beginning as we look forward to Monday, Thursday and Good Friday and Easter. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Thursday of that week. It's from Matthew 26, beginning in verse 36. I would invite you to follow along. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit down while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even unto death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and he prayed, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Then Jesus came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not stay awake with me for one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, Jesus went away for a second time and prayed, my father, if this cannot pass until I drink it, your will be done. And Jesus came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went and he prayed for a third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is here. May God add blessing to our reading and understanding of these words. So throughout this Lenten journey, we've been trying to find ourselves, identify ourselves in the story of Holy Week in these last few hours of Jesus's life with the crowds and the unnamed women, with Jesus or the naysayers to see if we might find a piece of our own story in these final hours of Jesus's story and to see if we might find instruction and invitation to risk something in the midst of all of it. Uh, remember where we began the story with the parade and the triumphal entry. Of, of course, uh, this is where we find ourselves on the calendar today in the church calendar as we celebrate Palm Sunday and we hear the echoes of the crowd, all the excitement, those who proclaim and exclaim Hosanna in the highest. In other words, save us, we pray. We join in welcoming the unexpected king. But by Thursday night, where our scripture reading is today, the tone has changed. Jesus has shared the Last Supper, instituted the act of Holy Communion, and withdrawn to this place to pray. There are no more crowds, just his people, his closest tribe. And even as we hear the echoes of Hosanna today, we know that we're mere hours away from Good Friday, and when the crowd will instead yell, crucify, as they turn on the one that they welcomed. He is only uh, the closest friends still gathered with him and they too will fall away. But if we really zoom into this scene, what I love about it and what I think is so powerful about it is that it's some of the most intimate, personal and instructive moments in Holy Week and in all of the scriptures. And we learn a lot about Jesus as we would anyone when they're uh, pushed into a corner, when their world is closing, when it feels like there's darkness around, when the struggle is at its most intense, we learn a lot about who he is. One note and a bit of an invitation for you as we go through, uh, we will wrap up our, our study of Holy Week here, but Holy Week is just kicking off. Monday, Thursday, we'll look more at the betrayal, even as we revisit the idea of communion. We've got a service at 7 p.m. in person or streaming online. Uh, we'll also have a Good Friday service at 7 p.m. Pastor Cheryl, Pastor Nanette, and I will be doing the seven last words of Jesus as we look at the trial and then the ultimate, uh, ultimately look at the cross uh, to understand what that means for us as a people of faith. I want you to consider being a part of that. In our scripture reading, Matthew has several ways to express the weight of this particular moment. There will be language to illustrate the intimacy of this, this scene in the garden as Jesus um, is sort of uh, telling us, or, or the Matthew is telling us as, as Jesus goes deeper and deeper into the garden. I want to say a word about that, why we call it the Garden of Gethsemane. It actually is never called that in the scriptures. We have an account of it being a garden in John's gospel. Uh, we have Luke telling us just that it's at the Mount of Olives. And then we have Matthew and, and Mark who tell us that it is Gethsemane. Gethsemane. And so what's happened is that it seems all of them are pointing to the same place uh, across the Kidron Valley in the Mount of Olives. And they all seem to be saying this happened at the same place. And, and we sort of 
put the accounts together to call it the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where that idea comes from. It's just an interesting uh, thing that, that, that it never says that in the scriptures. But I want us to think about that. This was a place that the scriptures say Jesus went to regularly to pray. Where is it that you withdraw? What, what is the secret or sacred place that you go to to really connect with your soul, to connect with God, to be in prayer when things get really, really difficult? Where is that place? We also experience the idea of intimacy as we overhear Jesus' prayer. There, there is nothing more intimate than the prayers that we pray when, when we're in that dark night of the soul, when there's nothing left for us to do except for to pray. We see how personal this moment is for Jesus as he interacts with, with his tribe, with his followers, with the few people who are still left by his side. Uh, this week, I took time to read through all four of the gospel accounts multiple times and there was something that stuck out to me as I was reading them. Uh, I, it struck me how many times, particularly in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus says to his disciples to stay awake with him. Over and over, he asks those who remain, those few friends around him, to stay awake with him. And that got me thinking and wondering what that might mean for us. And so my message this morning really is quite simple. I want us to think about if, if Jesus were asking us to stay awake with him, not only physically, but, but mentally and spiritually and emotionally, to be uh, alert and aware and awake. How might we hear those words today? I want us to wrestle with that question this morning. If Jesus were asking us to stay awake with him, might he be asking us not to turn from grief? I got to tell you, this one really hit me hard this week. Jesus says that he's deeply grieved, even grieved unto death, and that he wants his friends to stay awake with him. Perhaps part of what he's, he's asking them to do is not to turn away from their grief. That can be so hard. Uh, when I walk with families through a season of loss or grief, uh, particularly after the loss of a loved one, sometimes it's a whole family or several people in a family. Sometimes it's just one person, but it feels like there is always a, at least a couple who really struggle to, to look loss in the face. Like when, when, when everything has changed, uh, when, when a possibility or hopes or promises or, or a loved one that's always been there is suddenly going to be gone, when it seems like there's less options for a future, uh, there are folks that are just wired up not to be able to or, or not to do a very good job of, of looking it in the face, of wrestling with loss. Almost every time I experience this, it's the way that some of us work. But truthfully, we all do that in one way or another. When we experience some sort of loss or change or grief or difficulty, uh, sometimes we just simply want to look away. We want to have nothing to do with it. We want to pretend as if it is, hasn't happened and everything is going to be okay and it's all going to go back just how it used to be. But it's not only at the personal level that we experience this. Maybe we hear Jesus' admonition uh, not to turn away from grief and we think about wars that are going on. We think about refugees that are free, fleeing not only from Ukraine, but in other places around the world. We hear of violence in our schools, of the lack of resources for those who wrestle with homelessness and with mental health issues right here in our community. Maybe we hear about human rights violations around the world and at home. We, we hear about broken systems. I mean, you understand it. There's all kinds of stuff going on. People who are really hurting and suffering. Maybe there's a a particular country, a particular part of the world, a particular neighborhood in our city that comes to mind when you think about that. And we see this happening on the news all the time. And all of it, as it happens, threatens to leave us calloused, uh, leave us feeling indifferent, leave us feeling detached from it. All of it threatens to leave us sleeping on the needs of the world within ourselves and within uh, the globe generally. When we encounter grief and pain, often we want to avoid it and look away or we don't do that and we end up numbing or, or stuffing or doing something just to be distracted from it. Anything to ignore it. And with either of those fr things, friends, I, I think we're denying a part of our humanity, of our own human experience, part of what Jesus himself experiences. Jesus wants us to remain fully alive. And so could it be that he's calling us not to turn away, but instead to stay awake, even to grief? in ourselves and in the world? What else might his words mean for us? If Jesus were asking us to stay awake with him, might he be asking us to avoid temptation? He says that explicitly. Stay awake that you might avoid temptation, that you might not fall into trial or temptation. 
Perhaps this is a call and a reminder for us to stay, stay diligent against our vices, against the, the things that would seduce us. And what do I mean by that? Things that would promise fulfillment that they can never ultimately satisfy. Uh, to remain true to the path that, that we know that, that we're called to, even if no one would take notice if we strayed from the path. Uh, I think it means that, that we... Um, stay diligent about temptations that, that we have to be our own gods, or, or maybe even to feel like we need to be our own God, that we need not to answer to, to some higher power beyond ourselves, or, or that it's safest to remain at arm's length away from our brothers and sisters and neighbors. Maybe it's the destructive patterns that we have in our lives, the hurts and hangups and habits we experience now, or, or maybe it's something we thought we were past by this point in our life, that's rearing its head right now, the distortions in understanding of self and of neighbor, the belief that that we will be enough only once we achieve some particular thing. We see it in deflated egos and inflated egos, seeking status and validation, seeking accomplishment and approval. Maybe Jesus is telling us to stay awake and aware that we might actively choose not to fall into temptation. And friends, if temptation is weakness, uh, we can also fall uh, fall asleep on our strength. And here's what I mean by that. If Jesus is asking us to stay awake with him, maybe he's also asking us to stay awake to our own power and our own agency. Might it be that he's asking us to reckon with our strength and resources and gifts and abilities, not to fall asleep on how it is that we use all of who we are, all of the gifts that God has given to us in order to, to build the kingdom that God wants, how we use our bodies and our time and our resources, that we not fall into complacency with our relationship with others, with our relationship with God and our service to the world and our care for the world and of ourselves, not to accept anything less than the goodness that God has imagined for God's kingdom and for each one of us, and to trust that ultimately and finally, we all are invited to be in the work of making God's kingdom known in the world around us. Might this be a call to remember all that we've been blessed with, community, resources, experience, gifts, talents, perspectives, and and ask to share those with the people who are nearby to remember the times that God has journeyed through us, with us through a particularly dark night of the soul or a particularly deep valley. Maybe we didn't recognize it at the time, but we looked back and we realized that we never went alone, that God was there and that somehow in that journey we grew stronger. Perhaps some of that experience can be instructive and helpful to somebody else who's in the same season of life. As the world is hurting and we have a tendency to throw up our hands in frustration and disgust, to to just give up, might it be that we're called instead to engage and to work and to push and to move God's world towards God's vision? Could it be that Jesus is asking us to stay awake to our own power and potency? What is it for you? When, When you hear Jesus ask you to stay awake. What's that mean? What does that look like? For what might Jesus be calling you to stay alert? I think for each one of us, if we let ourselves be honest for a moment, we could hear that call, that we would know pretty easily and pretty quickly and pretty clearly what it is that God might be calling us to stay awake for and what shape and form that may take for us. I think we'll see that there are deep valleys ahead. But we can also trust that as we go on that journey, there will be great mountaintops. And so maybe some of those things are a reinvigorated relationship with God. Maybe it's a recommitment to to marriage or a renewed energy for, for a work or a cause on behalf of the hurting. Maybe it's a reckoning with our role in in our family or our friend group or a reimagining of our place in community or church. What do those things look like? Now is the time to ask those questions because this last final week of Lent, this, this holy week, is the time where we really uh, can, can be changed as we bring those things forward. When we bring those to our minds, what we'll find 
is the best of the human experience and the worst of the human experience. We'll see Jesus uh, experience great suffering and great joy. And so calling to mind those things, I think, helps us put all of this, this season that leads us up to Easter and Easter morning into perspective about all that God is able to do in our lives. It's so good for us to remember this right here, right on the cusp of Holy Week and to trust that God might be working in and through us, even in these moments, to fix all that is broken and hurting and to indeed make us new. There's one thing that I think is important and nearly universal. We, we talk about what we're being asked to stay awake for. I believe that for each one of us, part of the answer to that question is actually in the question itself. Jesus asks us to stay awake with him. He says it twice in our scripture, stay awake with me. Might it be that Jesus is calling us to stay awake to our relationship with God, to, to, to be aware of God's presence with us, Beloved, I don't know who needs to hear this, but, but I do believe we need to be reminded that we don't go on this road alone. In times of grief and temptation, when we lose track of our potency and our power, you do not go by yourself. When we talk about maintaining our spiritual and emotional health, staying awake and aware and alive and alert, we're not left to our own devices. Jesus invites his disciples and invites us to stay awake with him. We go not alone for the struggle and the fight, for the grief and the guilt, for the doubt and the weariness. We have a companion and a partner who is with us and for us and whose ridiculous love for us will not let you go. Stay awake with him and to his presence in your life. Jesus shows us what this looks like in the story. He models how we do it, how we draw closer to God. In this passage, we see him in a deep and a dark valley. And in this personal moment, we get a picture of the intimacy that exists and Jesus is instructive about how we might live in the midst of our, our deep valleys. Jesus goes deeper and deeper into the garden and I often like to think about that as Jesus moving deeper and deeper into that most sacred place or, or that, that holy place or, or as he sort of uh, moves into that secret place, maybe even moving deeper into his soul. Maybe that's how you imagine this. When he does all of that, what does he do? He prays. And friends, I think that's critically important. It's simple, but we can miss it. Notice what his prayer is and isn't. It, it's, it's honest. It's raw. It's not elegant or eloquent. It's not complex. Just real, earnest, pouring out of his hopes and wants and struggles and doubts and fears and disappointments and hopes. Amy Jill Levine talks about this moment as the importance of prayer, even when we know that the answer will be no. That's a powerful statement for me. Jesus here demonstrating the importance of prayer, even when we know the answer is going to be no. What is the importance of prayer in that moment? I think the, the importance of prayer, when we know it's not going to end up how we, how we think it will, or we think that it may well end up poorly, is relationship. It's honesty. It's vulnerability. It's trust. To stay awake to our relationship, our presence, our life within God. The life of prayer is part of how we stay awake to Jesus. And it's how we remain in relationship with God, even when things feel like they're falling apart, even when our prayers aren't going to get the answers we would prefer. Whether it comes in the groans of the garden or the cries of Paul's, Palm Sunday, Hosanna, save us, we pray. Prayer is pivotal, formal or simple spontaneous or planned. It's the heartbeat of how this relationship is sustained. It's how our connection to the divine is cultivated and how relationship is built that can see us through guilt and temptation and feelings of insufficiency, through any challenge or struggle or doubt or trial. It's how we stay awake to God and learn to lean on and trust in God's grace and goodness in any season of life. Uh, this week, as I was preparing for this message, I was reminded of one of my favorite books, The Shack, and, and these words jumped out to me. I, I actually didn't remember this particular part of it, but I think it illustrates the power and the importance 
uh, of this last little bit uh, about remaining in connection and in prayer to God, staying awake to our relationship with Jesus so that we can be sustained through any temptation, through any trial, through any grief and doubt, through fears that, that we ourselves are not enough. In this uh, particular reading, Mac, the main character of the story, is talking with the first person of the Trinity, who's called Papa, and with the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, called Sarah Yu. And I would invite you to hear these words. The real underlying flaw in your life, Mackenzie, Mac, is that you don't think that I am good. If you knew I was good and that everything, the means, the end, and all the processes of individual life is all covered my, by my goodness, then while you may not always understand what I am doing, you would trust me. But you don't. I don't, asked Mac, but it wasn't really a question. It was a statement of fact, and he knew it. The others seemed to know it, know it as well, and the table remained silent. Sarah, you spoke. Mac, you cannot produce trust just as you cannot do humility. It either is or is not. Trust is the fruit of a relationship to which you are loved, is the fruit of a relationship in which you know you are loved. Because you do not know that I love you, you cannot trust me. Again, there was silence, and finally Mac looked up and Papa spoke, at Papa and spoke. I don't know how to change that. You can't, not alone, Papa said, but together we will watch that change take place. For now, I just want you to be with me and discover that our relationship is not about performance or you having to please me. I'm not a bully or some self-centered, demanding deity insisting on my own way. I'm good, and I desire only what is best for you. You cannot find that through guilt or condemnation or coercion, only through a relationship of love. And I do love you. Friends, I believe that in this time, in this place, God is inviting us to continue to stay awake to God's own love and grace in our lives, to stay awake through grief that sometimes threatens to crush us, to stay awake through temptation that attempts to lead us astray, to find our own potency and power. Each one of us is being called to be aware and be in relationship with God. It's what we see Jesus modeling this night. And I pray that for each one of us, we will experience that in some small way in this holy week as we move together towards Easter. So may it be each and every day. Amen. Would you take a few moments for reflection?